Uh, my paper will be focused on 14th century Iceland and on a sort of particular group of people and group of sources that give us um, distinctive insight into bilingual learning um, uh, and bilingual clerical learning specifically uh, in this context. So first, since I uh, not many people here are experts on 14th century Iceland, some historical context. Uh, the end of the period that, that anybody cares about, or the end of the period that anybody outside Iceland cares about, is around the middle of the 13th century. So Icelandic independence ends in 1262 to 1264. This it falls under the, uh, the Norwegian crown and has a sort of period of being, a, you might say, a Norwegian colony before it becomes a Danish colony. So naturally, uh, from this point, you have a period of political and legal change. The 1270s and 1280s are known for the new law codes, uh, both secular and ecclesiastical law codes that were developed. Um, and then as the sort of old aristocratic, uh, let's say, political structure uh, and ecclesiastical structure uh, is replaced we have a conflict over proprietary churches known as the Stadamal that nominally ends in 1295. There continue to be proprietary churches and, and there are issues with this for some time, but the main conflict is over at that point. Um, and we also have a number of administrative offices as the old sort of chieftain class is, is dissolved. Though of course the same families and the same people often fulfill these new offices. So then we get to the 14th century, which is actually commonly known as the Norwegian century, um, which is the period when we then have more, let's say, social and cultural adaptation um, to these changes and consolidation of these changes. Uh, and the ecclesiastical side of that is very important. Uh, there is a large number of Northern B Norwegian bishops in both Icelandic dioceses, that is Holag in the north of Iceland and Skalholt in the, in the south, but in the south being the other, you know, three quarters of Iceland, uh, it, possibly even the majority of, of, of bishops during this century are Norwegian, I keep forgetting to count them. Uh, and this whole series of changes arguably took much longer in the Northern Diocese of Polar, which is relevant to the paper because I'm going to be talking about the North. Getting to uh, education means getting to the sort of textual aspect of these changes. So a lot of the changes are um, kind of what you would expect, both from the sort of the later 13th, 14th century across Latin Europe, but also uh, following the big political shift. So we have rapidly growing bureaucracy, administrative textuality by Icelandic standards. We're still, still talking about an entirely rural island with no cities or towns of any kind. So, you know, our level of administrative writing is still arguably fairly minimal, um, but it grows quickly in the 14th century. And then particularly after around the middle of the century is when we start getting certain types of documents in much larger numbers. It is more recently, uh, been acknowledged that this is an apex of Icelandic culture in certain ways, uh, mostly by manuscript scholars, I think because there are just a lot of manuscripts in the 14th century. Some of the more interesting sagas were written at this time, uh, but for my purposes, the most relevant cultural shift is new uh, are the new approaches to religious literature. Um, so the 14th century is famous, um, and again, this starts in the late 13th century, but associated with the 14th century is the florid style of hagiography, where old hagiographical texts that were written, commonly written or translated in the, uh, the early 13th, end of the 12th, beginning of the 13th century, um, are rewritten or even sometimes retranslated in a more ornate Latinate style. So this is overall a context in which we would expect new forms of identity, uh, new new sort of like groups of clerical identity, changing uh, attitudes towards uh, 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 Icelanders' own intellectual culture. So the florid style in particular has been associated with this, um, what Sverre Thomason called a Northern Benedictine school, which is kind of what I'm going to be talking about using very similar sources to what, what he used in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but Erica Sigurdsson has recently sort of highlighted this from a slightly more broad perspective, though again, she's, she's largely using Northern sources. Um, when she pointed out that this culture was relentlessly learned, upholding to the point of fetishizing aspects of Christian learning, such as Latinity, knowledge of canon law and legal process, and ecclesiastical administration. 14th century clerics valued the jargon and processional 
apparatus of the law and of ecclesiastical bureaucracy. And I mean, her tone here is a little dismissive. I feel like she's slightly overstating her point, but it is, I, I, I think, a very, very important book for getting after, getting at the idea that like ecclesiastical tr culture and identity is, is changing in the 14th century. And this is, of course, something that would be tied to educational culture as well. So to get at bilingual education, on the one hand, of course, in you know Latin medieval Europe, all education to a certain extent is bilingual, involves some amount of Latin and some amount of vernacular. Um, but to get into the more spe you know specific aspects is very difficult in Iceland because uh, we have kind of the opposite situation that we have in a, in a lot of other regions of, of, of Western Europe where we have almost no surviving Latin texts. I think we have one full liturgical text, uh, fewer fragments than the rest of Scandinavia, and almost nothing of, of non-liturgical writings. Um, so to try to get at Latin culture, we need to either work, um, we need to work indirectly in different kinds of ways to look at um, Latin culture in general and bilingual education specifically. So the two angles I'm thinking about uh, uh, with this this paper and sort of this aspect of my research are looking at Latin education from the way it is described, and then looking at Latin education as a sort of background context for texts that are written. So for narrative sources, by far the most important text for education in Iceland uh, is the saga of Bishop Laurentius Kelsen. This is also the import most important narrative source for the 14th century. It is the only narrative source for 14th century Iceland, if you don't count analytic writings. Um, it has more details about education than any other saga. I think the saga of Bishop uh, of St. Jón of Hólar is more famous for this because it has a sort of vivid description of the cathedral school at Hólar, but there is objectively much more in the Rentia saga. It's just not as commonly read a saga. Um, and specifically for my purposes, it is describing a network of students around a teacher. Laurentius spends uh, uh, much of his career before he becomes bishop um, as a teacher, first at the cathedral and then a long time as a teacher at several monasteries and then finally at Fingerar Monastery, a Benedictine, the oldest Benedictine monastery in Northern Iceland. Uh, so that is a very important uh, source. And then we have, I think, more, uh, more well-known sources for Icelandic education, the Old Norse grammatical treatises. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the sort of um, various vernacular poetic traditions that produced grammatical treatises. Uh, you know, the, the, the Irish tradition and the Austrian tradition are particularly well known, but there's Welsh traditions, and I'm sure there are many others. So the Old Norse grammatical treatises were collectively written between the middle of the 12th and the middle of the 14th century. Um, I can't really summarize them all here, but the, the first grammatical treatise is, uh, is in what, some sense the most famous as a source for, or, uh, uh, the, the Icelandic Old Norse language during the mid 12th century when there are almost no other sources and it is a, written by somebody with quite an ear for language. The second grammatical treatise is a, it's a later orthographic treatise. The Snorra Edda is, is, is I think, uh, certainly the most famous text on this list. Probably most people wouldn't necessarily think of it as a grammatical treatise, and it is, but it's just kind of a weird one, um, and that deals with poetics and mythography. But then the treatises that really concern me here are the third and the fourth, because these are these are our translated grammatical treatises. These are sort of what people think of, for people who think of this, uh, when they think of um, vernacular uh, grammatical writing in sort of later medieval Europe, where this is, you take your Donatus, you take your Frisian, your uh, Gracchismus uh, Doctrinala, uh, and you translate them, and then you you replace the Latin poetic examples with uh, uh, vernacular poetic examples. Uh, and the third grammatical treatise is sort of a full Ars Poetica. It has a discussion of letters and syllables and so on, and then goes into barbarism and solecism. Um, and then the fourth grammatical treatise is written as an extension of this um, uh, uh, moving on into to discussion of figures and tropes that aren't dealt with in the third grammatical treatise. So from this perspective, we have, I think, kind of two different angles. Uh, uh, as I'll get into, the Laurentius saga kind of gives us our Latin education, um, and the uh, grammatical treatises give us our vernacular education, but they give us a particular kind of vernacular education if we focus on these two later treatises. And this education we can we can tie to Thingarar Monastery, which is why it's particularly useful to read with Rentia Saga. 
Um, and this is because the Codex Verbianus and 242 Quarto from the mid 14th century uh, is both the only manuscript to contain all of the Old Norse grammatical treatises um, and uh, for people who actually work with manuscripts, which is not me, uh, it has been associated with Thingaro Monastery, um, presumably written at or near the monastery. The scribe is, you know, people speculate whether the scribe also wrote the fourth grammatical treatise. Um, uh, so that is, uh, that ties it to the monastery and ties it to the sort of context that I'm interested in. Um, but we can also, if we let ourselves speculate a little bit more, also, uh, um, relate this manuscript to uh, a, a, a bilingual educational context. And this is, I'm borrowing heavily from scholars, old English scholars who have worked on uh, Elfrich's grammatical writing. So essentially the idea is that you build a, a vernacular metalanguage uh, in part through teaching Latin. So as you are uh, as you are explaining Latin words, particularly complicated Latin words, or as you're going through Latin grammar and talking about perfects and pluperfects and imperfect verbs and whatnot, you tend to use uh, vernacular words uh, to sort of try to explain these Latin ideas. And sometimes this vernacular metal language is only used in the in the classroom. It is, you know, it is it's almost just like a like an etymological explanation rather than a real word. But sometimes these words develop wider usage. And we get a lot of interesting examples of that from our uh, two latest, uh, later uh, grammatical treatises. So an example would be like some uh, nut for comparativos. It's literally a, a sort of laying together. Um, and the, you know, uh, one that actually, you know, develops into a, a, a modern Icelandic word. Many of these don't. Um, is uh for nominativus. It is, you know, noun-ish, noun name-like, uh, however you want to explain that. So a lot of these words are rare. Several of them are unique to these treatises. But what is important about them is when you have something like the Old English grammatical texts, these are glossing words, or these are always written parallel to the Latin word. So there's no evidence in the Old English corpus of these particular kinds of words being used independently. Um, and scholars have tended to argue that that is, you know, th that they existed as sort of explan explanatory words. My argument when I was working on this is that this is where these words came from in the Old Norse context. But then by the time we get to these grammatical treatises, because there's no Latin word being used in parallel to these, that these words have an independent usage and have developed maybe a stronger usage in a pedagogical context. But also not just a pedagogical context, because even though there are certain words that only appear in these uh, treatises, some of the other words that are still very rare um, do also appear in literary texts and specifically in that florid style hagiography. And there's both sort of calcs, but there's also some interesting loan words like uh, figura is one I worked on for, for my book. If any of you are curious, we can talk about figures as well. Okay, so these are treatises about poetics um, and, and arguably these are evidence for bilingual education. So what can we, what can we learn about uh, bilingual education from the poetry itself? Um, so the, the, the treatises are concerned strictly with vernacular poetry. Laurentius Saga is, on the other hand, concerned strictly with Latin poetry. Um, it, is, uh, it is, as Erica Sigurdsson sort of hinted at, and it, is, it, is very, uh, it spends a lot of time praising Lat Latinus, good Latinus in the saga. And all of Laurentius's students that he taught at Thingarar um, are praised as excellent poets. The term it uses is versificatores, which is... I, you know, I would argue, and I think most people would agree with me, that this is it's the, the saga's way of distinguishing Latin poet poets or Latin poetic skill from vernacular poetic skill. So we have students like A.L. Edelson, who's the future bishop, Bertha Goodmanson, who becomes an important deacon in the Southern Diocese at Skullholt, and then Outney Laurentius's own son, who became a monk with him at Thegarar, and then a teacher uh, and sort of follower at the cathedral. And then Laurentius himself is, is sort of the most iconic superhuman Latinist at all. At, at, uh, around the end of his own education, when he is sort of transitioning from a student to almost immediately becoming a teacher at the cathedral school, he said, the saga says that he then became so outstanding in clerical lear learning, in composition, and in Latin versification that he could compose verse as quickly as someone speaking Latin as fast 
just he just spoke in Latin verse, essentially. Um, but we also have an interesting follow up to this where Laurentius is sort of symbolically moving beyond his grammatical education. He is already, you know, a master poet, a master grammarian, um, but he eventually becomes a, a, a quite a good can lawyer or, you know, quite a good by the, you know, from the saga's perspective. Uh, and he does this through this episode where he's gone to the archbishop Rick at Nidros and the archbishop has asked him to sort of show off his Latin skill. Um, and, and and before he moves on to canon law, and Laurentius composes a Latin praise poem of a Benedictine abbess named uh, Hatbera. Uh, and this is intriguing because for all of our lack of Latin literature from Iceland, we have two surviving stanzas in Latin written in an ecclesiastical context and in a 14th century ecclesiastical context. And the first one even is a praise poem. It is written in praise of a certain Oithen, who's almost certainly Oithen Rovi, the bishop right before Laurentius. So this verse was probably composed by somebody who knew who Laurentius knew. You know, this is not a huge sort of elite clerical community. Everybody kind of knew everybody. Uh, and then the second one is arguably from a monastic context because it is urging a certain Thomas to dedicate himself or dedicate himself more to the religious life. What is interesting from the perspective of bilingual education is that both of these are written in skaldic meters. They're written in Latin, uh, but they're written in the meter of vernacular courtly poetry, which, which suggests this kind of uh, shared context with, with my saga, with the, the fourth grammatical treatise, this monastic elite uh, bilingual context. And I would argue that the exchange um, between Latin poetics and vernacular poetics that is happening that seems to be happening at Fingerdrag is part of a shared bilingual education, bilingual educational context that valued both types of poetic learning. Obviously, teaching Latin is the priority if you're training clerics or training monks, but that there is still some kind of value uh, given to vernacular poetry as well. Uh, and some of this is obvious. Some of this is, is, has been commented on before. I think one of my big arguments is that I think that this is drawing on multiple, this community, this, this sort of new clerical identity is drawing on multiple existing intellectual traditions. It's not just about poetics. These grammatical treatises are sort of cohesive in that they're all transmitted in this one manuscript. But I think if we're, if we're concerned with thing about our educational culture, we have to think a little bit more broadly. Um, and one of the more obvious examples of another intellectual tradition that is still sort of related is the hagiography, is the new florid style um, that is drawing from the same sort of, uh, the same distinct body of vocabulary. And this appears in Laurentius Saga as well. Uh, one of Laurentius's most famous students, uh, Berger Sokerson, uh, was a highly educated man, surpassing most people in Iceland in clerical learning, writing, song, and eloquence. He had composed many saints' lives in Norse, which will shine forth and be manifest as long as this country is inhabited. So this is one of the only times the saga that is obsessed with Latinity is actually concerned with uh, uh, Old Norse literature is in the composition of these mon monastic students, um, and Berger Sogason, I think is an abbot by this point, um, is the composition of new hagiography by them. And we get a hint at this with Laurentius' son. So the saga doesn't reference it directly, but Arnbi Laurentius' son um, is, uh, did at one point translate a life of St. Dunstan into Old Norse. Uh, and he was extremely valued as a teacher uh, to the point that his father is a real ass. So his father is on his deathbed um, or you know, shortly on his deathbed. Arnbi is also sick. Um, appears to be an alcoholic, depending on how literally you want to take this passage. And, and Laurentius says to him, if you will make this vow to God and me, that you will go back into your monastery thing around as soon as you have lost me, as soon as I've died, then for your sake, I will dare to make the unworthy request of God that you recover from this illness, because in the monastery at Thingarar, you can bring great benefit through teaching and writing. So your life only has value to me if you go to the monastery and teach them. But if you have a mind to ignore our command and travel to Norway when you lose us, which is actually what happens, then you are condemning yourself because we know you will lay yourself out in drunkenness and other wickedness, and the holiness, Holy Church will get no benefit from your learning. It's debatable whether or not that happened. So uh, I don't really have time to get into other interesting examples, but I think one thing I want to, is important to point out 
about the complexity of the linguistic I ideologies and the attitudes towards Latin and the monks by these clerics and by these monks are places where Laurentius Saga is actually critical of the Tenery, because there are two people that are university educated, excellent Latinists that are mocked for the way they use Norse. The, the more famous example is uh, uh, Jon Fleming, uh, John the Fleming, um, who uh, is a canon lawyer at Nitharos when, when Laurentius is learning there. And he is constantly mocked, just not by not just by Laurentius, but by the archbishop himself for trying to speak Norse very badly. Uh, and a slightly more serious example is when Bishop Jon Halderson, who is arguably half Icelandic, but at the very least is Norwegian, also university, edu university educated, when he uses Latin in a context where the sort of rhetorical situation would call for Norse, and Laurentius sort of jabs him with that. So my overall argument then is that Laurentius helped to create a group um, that had a distinct identity. And part of their identity was using both uh, Old Norse and Latin for, for teaching, for literature, for, for everything, but also knowing when and how to use them. And this uh, identity and this ideology shaped the education that they received, but also the education that they passed on to their students. Um, thank you.